I've been exploring wild Africa for decades, and I'm here in Kenya's Maasai Mara for the greatest wildlife spectacle on Earth. I'm Art Wolf. Join me on Travels to the Edge. I've been photographing wild Africa for decades. Each time I return, I try to capture it in a new way. The East African countries of Tanzania and Kenya share the open savanna that is home to great nomadic herds. These grasslands stretch from the Serengeti in northern Tanzania into southwest Kenya where they intersect the large Maasai Mara Reserve. Whenever I return to an environment, I'm always working with a guide, and in this case, it's Andreas Bifani. He really knows his stuff. And so I'm in great hands when I'm working with him and driving through the savannas of East Africa. We are in the middle of the migration when over 1.2, 1.5 million wildebeest come from uh, the Serengeti into the Maasai Mara. Why are they coming up here, do you think? They're coming because of the grass. There's so many of them that they're constantly migrating. I can't think of any place on Earth where you have such an immense scale of mammals on the move. When I first came to the Mara, like many photographers, you're overwhelmed with the spectacle of all the animals, and I tried to document every bird, every mammal. Now I'm really trying to translate the migration into much more abstract, impressionistic, emotional recordings. see this many wildebeest and zebras moving, they invariably kick up the dust. They envelop their own bodies into this layer of dust, which just gives it a sense of art to it, a mist and a softness that is very reminiscent of painting. In addition to the Great Migration, working in the Mara provides many opportunities. Not only are there zebras and giraffes and elephants, but there's also the predators, the leopards, the lions, and here the cheetah. Wow, that's a nice pose right now. It's looking up. It more than likely is heading towards the impala that it took earlier today. It's very wary because often when they make a kill, other predators take over. So he's watching for lions, he's watching for hyenas, and potentially leopards. is the rarest of the large cats in Africa. We're very fortunate to see this one out here in the open plains. The color of the cheetah is so perfectly adapted to the beige of the savanna grass, and then the spots break up its outline until it just blends in to this habitat. After the cheetah feeds upon the impala, vultures and storks will quickly come in, and by tomorrow midday, there will be nothing left of this impala except for the skeleton. It's an amazing ecosystem where nothing goes to waste. Mm. 
the sounds of these hippos are pretty spectacular as they blow air out of their nostrils as they're coming up to the surface. It's just fun to watch them. This is very typical of encountering lions in the bush. Often they're laying down, sleeping because they've made a kill during the middle of the night. Right now I'm getting some beautiful catch light on this one baby. In fact, I'm gonna put on an extender which enables me to focus closer and zero right in on this one cub's head. The light is coming right down through the trees and catching the eye of the cats. And these lions have beautiful big eyes and I just want to accentuate that. individual zebra is quite striking. When you see a herd of zebras, it's overwhelming with this vortex of motion and line and pattern. To see them come down to the water's edge to drink and when they all align next to each other. Yes, it's wildlife, but it's also pure art from my perspective. This is a fantastic opportunity. All these wildebeest are coming down for a drink and it just epitomizes the primeval nature of this migration. All these horns, the backs. This is what I live for, these moments where you're just surrounded by wild animals in such numbers that you forget where you are. When these animals are running by at such close range, your senses are overwhelmed. You feel like you're witnessing something extraordinarily special. I totally get lost in the swirl and the vortex of motion and emotion that plays out every year here in the plains of East Africa. Alexi, I hey, haven't seen Alex, you in about five years. Long time. <laughs> nice to see you. Hey, you're looking I've really worked fit. with Alexi right? Peltier many times over the years, and it's great to see him again and to go flying over this wild area. And I love Alexi. He's full of beans. He's a great pilot, and he really knows how to put me in the greatest situations when it comes to photography. I know you like the green colors. You like the pattern, artistic pattern. I know you like the pinkish with the green behind. And patterns and, and patterns and patterns. And I know where to bring you. <laughs> good, good. I'm getting harnessed up to get up in the air and do some aerial work over an incredible display of flamingos. Flying up the Rift Valley is always a thrill. For me, it offers a different perspective from which to shoot. We're heading south towards a few small soda lakes. The algae and briny creatures that live in the alkaline waters support up to two million flamingos.
with a polarizer, I can darken the water so it's such a stark contrast. It's just artwork everywhere I look. shot of this hippo that's lying in the mud right at the water's edge. Whenever I can get two different species of animals in the same shot, I like to do that because it shows the relationship. It's quite alluring to be able to photograph big flocks of birds like this. Matches the spectacle we saw in the Mara with the tremendous numbers of wildebeest. So to move up here and to see up to five or six hundred thousand flamingos in a very small lake is a great opportunity. Flying over Lake Natron is like flying in an other world. There's nothing I've experienced that remotely looks like Natron with its brilliant red mineral deposits and these ridge crests of salt that define and give pattern to this landscape. in it. I mean, I'm just totally lost in it. Leaving the bizarre beauty of Lake Natron behind, we head north towards El Karama, in one of the more remote parts of Kenya. It's a place where ranchers and conservationists are working to protect and restore vast tracts of wilderness. So physically, whereabouts in Kenya are we? Since I, we were flying around, I really got confused. That is true. By flying, we go quick on <laughs> different places. Now, the thing is, we are just on the starting on the edge of the Lake Kipia Plateau. The place is called El Karama here. We have on the south there, we have uh, Mount Kenya. In the west, we have the Abadares. Abadares. You know you have the Ethiopia. Yep. And from here to Ethiopia, this is what I call the real Kenya. This is a completely private, unknown, and wild place. Boy, the sun is nice on these giraffes up ahead. Let's just see if we can't get a little closer. Oh, yes. This is beautiful. Look at them. Watch us. Wow. Look, this is, They're really curious about this these is horses, aren't they? Like in El Karama, we can do things like this, you know? I love this way of seeing animals in the African bush. Just uh, to be able to move amongst these herds is extraordinary. To approach animals like this, this is a real privilege. It's fantastic. Obviously, these are reticulated giraffes. Yes. They're really symbols of the northern part of Kenya. Completely, as you say. Reticulated giraffe is a very nice pattern. You see, it's quite clear. They have these long tongues that are able to really negotiate. 45 centimeters. 
Wow. Yeah, and they can thousand. wrap around these really pointy acacia thorns, right? Yeah, they like to, to eat the, the, the green leaves on top, you know? Such nice light on these giraffes. Oh, it's fantastic. Come in. Come on. Oh, trigger. This horse really moves around a lot. The giraffes are over here. These are beautiful animals, though. You know, in this late light, they just glow against this thorn acacia. Art, I really count on you to show to our future generation the beauty of Well, the world. this is my mission. This makes me so happy that you brought me up here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah, that's it. That's really These cool. giraffes are just incredible. this rhino from downwind. In other words, the wind is coming from the rhino towards me. And these rhinos really rely on the sense of smell, far less on the sense of sight. And I consequently have worked my way in fairly close to this black rhino, one of the most endangered species in all of Africa, once hunted and poached nearly to extinction. But these numbers are coming back now. And it's largely because they're on these protective ranches here in northern Kenya. And it may, in fact, be the salvation of the species. It is so different working with truly wild herds of elephant. They're really hard to predict. And before I get out of the vehicle and try to get a little closer, we're analyzing their behavior. So often wildlife photography is sitting back, giving it some time, reading the animals before we get in position to photograph them. Which is just there, uh, he knows we are here. Yeah. Even though we have a rifle here, we would never aim it at the animal. Never. We would aim it in the air and make a noise. Never. In fact, uh, if we charge, we did wrong. Don't move too fast. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So we are out of his way. Yeah. A shot of the elephant walking through the vegetation right now. I'm taking very long exposures, creating a sense of movement. Nice full vertical shots. Looking at me. Nice, very nice portrait right now. Keep an eye, keep an eye. Keep an eye. Okay, keep an eye. You know we're here. Don't make breast, don't, right. don't move, don't move fast, don't right, move fast. Right, right, Okay, that's all right. Nice. 
This was a very nice encounter with a truly wild elephant. And as you can see, they're not aggressive animals. This one was very curious, walked by, took a look at me. I didn't move. It was very, very nice. I like when they grab the dust and they throw it on their back. Oh, this is getting great. That is a really great shot. And you know they have 40,000 muscles in the, in the trunk. 40,000 muscles? They need five years to be able to use the trunk. Elephants are the most engaging. They're always showing different expressions. And look at this one coming straight towards them. Slowly, slowly. Come slowly. We show him that we're not aggressive. Uh, hey, Sean, 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 reverse. Sean, you have to reverse, Sean. Okay, okay. good. Perfect. Now we, we, we're okay. Good. Very nice shots. I like that sequence. Very good. Thank you. This is the way wildlife photography should be. The animals are relaxed. We placed ourselves in a situation that they came towards us. We got our shots. Everybody leaves happy. Right? Good. And you Absolutely. behaved good. <laughs> That's and I behaved good, which is abnormal. <laughs> to fly on this part of the world is, is the gift of life. I'm passionate about the beauty of the world, and in Kenya, all the ingredients are here to explain how the conservation with people and uh, the, the beauty can really work. Here is a real gift. Kenya's rich diversity offers a glimpse of Africa as a whole, a land where the delicate balance between wildlife and people plays out on a grand scale. I'm Art Wolf. Join me on the next Travels to the Edge. Millions of years ago, this island, Madagascar, split off from Africa. Since then, the animals and plants have taken off on a bizarre and incredible evolutionary journey. I'm Art Wolf, exploring wild Madagascar. Join me on Travels to the Edge. Madagascar lies off the southeast coast of Africa, the fourth largest oceanic island on Earth. Its size and geographic isolation have given rise to an abundance of biodiversity and unique landscapes. It's home to 5% of all the world's plants and animals, over 200,000 species. And 80% of those species are unique to Madagascar. While Madagascar is one of the world's largest islands, it is densely populated by its Malagasy people. Most of them are farmers, and as a result, 90% of the island's original habitat has been lost to agriculture. The places that remain intact in Madagascar are really there simply because they're so difficult to get to. The terrain and distances are great, and that is quite honestly why they still exist. I'm in the Singi Bamara 
National Park, which is the largest preserve here in Madagascar. The Singhi looks like this jagged matrix of pinnacles and mountains that are rising into the sky. I'm very excited to start to get in and explore the various caverns and ridges and valleys in between these very jagged karst limestone formations. The Singhi is a national park here in Madagascar, and so when you enter this landscape, you're required to have a guide. This is an amazing labyrinth of deep passageways and narrow canyons. And all along the way, there's roots that reach down from trees 200 feet above that get all the way down here into the deepest recesses where the water collects. The environment of the Singhi is a real challenge, not only to move through and negotiate these jagged, razor-sharp pinnacles or rocks, but just to get a photograph is a real challenge. get tired because you're either moving up or moving down, but rarely are you moving parallel. Whew. This is steep. Okay, crossing a 200 foot chasm above rock, razor rock. Oh yeah. try to do in a landscape like this is to emphasize what's most important about it and to me it's the texture of the rocks. This is truly a unique landscape here in Madagascar and yet Madagascar itself is a vast island of unique phenomenon. We're about to see and explore the rest of this great island. on this environmentally challenged island. Because of Madagascar's biological richness, it's the top priority for many of the world's conservation groups. Accompanying me on this journey through Madagascar is Russ Minnemeyer, noted conservationist and an expert in primatology. Russ, you've got projects all around the world. What, what's so great about Madagascar? Well, Madagascar, from a biodiversity perspective, is really a country of superlatives. Uh, we who work in the so-called biodiversity hotspots consider Madagascar to be the single highest priority hotspot on the planet. It's just an amazing place. I mean, it's been separated from the African mainland for probably about 160 million years and separated from India, to which it was also connected, for about 80 or 90 million years. So for that whole period, evolution has proceeded on its own in isolation from the rest of the world. So you've got a variety of animals here that are unique, and the levels of endemism, species that occur nowhere else, are unmatched on the planet. I mean, what attracted me here to begin with was the lemurs, these non-human primates that are 100% endemic to Madagascar. When I was here before, they were so gentle. They're almost like a polite monkey in a way. They're very much like a polite monkey. They're not terribly aggressive. You can get quite close to them. When you're walking through a forest like this, um, looking for lemurs, do you hear them first or see movement or what's? I would say about uh, 70, 80% of the time, you hear them. Ha 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 ha! 
Are they mad at me? Uh, no, they're just trying to let one another know where they are. This they is are a so loud. Black and white rough lemur call, which is one of the great sounds of the of the Malagasy forest. I've got two rough lemurs curled up on this branch high up in the forest canopy. They've got the same markings, the color patterns of a giant panda, but infinitely smaller and more slender. So how would you term this kind of forest right here? Well, this is a higher altitude rainforest, mm -hmm. a high plateau forest. We're at about 1,200 to 1,400 meters here. And this is the last big chunk of high altitude rainforest. It's beautiful with all the lichen. It really is pretty. It really is pretty. And this is very, very unique as a habitat. I'm photographing one of the most unique animals in all of Madagascar. It's called the leaf tail gecko. And they rely almost entirely on their ability to blend in on the trunks of these rainforest trees. So there's patches of lichens, and if their arm or their torso covers that lichen, they'll pick up the line of the lichen to continue their perfect camouflage. They seem to dissolve into this beautiful environment. Right now I'm photographing the largest of the lemurs, the entry, and he's just in the open. And I think I'm getting some pretty nice shots. It's a very special opportunity to be able to see these injuries because, in fact, they cannot be kept in captivity. They've never been successfully kept in captivity. So if you want to see them, you got to come to Madagascar. So I got a beautiful call. Oh, the call is just fantastic. And you have about 60, more than 60 groups. So this is a territorial call. And what they're doing is they're saying, hey, we're here. Don't invade our space. Otherwise, we'll have a fight. So it's a way of spacing the different groups. The Indri is the biggest of the living lemurs. It gets up to about nine kilos, a little over 20 pounds, and about a meter, maybe three feet tall. Fantastic animal. They have really funny ears, don't they? Yeah, yeah, and funny eyes. They look like they just came off a spaceship. I love photographing any animal that's got such strong colors and patterns. I love the lines and then the spots and more lines. And towards its head, it actually starts to turn green and red. Yeah, this is one of my favorites, if not my favorite chameleon, this little high altitude uh, Fursifer Campani chameleon. And to me, it looks like an aboriginal dot painting. I think it's just fabulous. As amazing as it is, it's just one example of the spectacular diversity of chameleons that you have here in Madagascar. More than 60 species, more species of chameleons than in any other country. So it's, it's, uh, it's again, one of these wonderful flagship groups like the lemurs that really make Madagascar what it is. I love photographing chameleons. They're so strange. They're the animal that seems to be made up of parts from all sorts of other animals. One of the most unique features of the chameleon is the fact that their eyes move independently from one another, and it gives them this really comical appearance. This is the Parsons chameleon, one of the two largest species of chameleons here in Madagascar, large enough, in fact, to even eat birds. Incredible animal. And you can see how slow this animal moves. And it's a strategy not only enabling it to 
catch its prey, but to escape predation by birds of prey and other animals that might, in fact, zero in on these creatures. They're an extraordinary animal, a reptile with personality. This is just the most beautiful of all the lemurs. This is the diadem seafoc. It's the second biggest after the Indri. And it moves by vertical clinging and leaping, and it's capable of these incredible jumps that can probably jump 30 feet at a shot. It's really got a lot of colors to it. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. This rainforest seems to go on forever, but how big is it actually? It's really a tiny fragment. This particular reserve in the adjacent national park is only a little over 10,000 hectares. It's about 25,000 acres. And Madagascar has already lost 90% of its original natural vegetation. And only 3% of the country is conserved. So there's a huge challenge ahead to make sure that virtually all of the remaining intact forest is conserved because it has so much biodiversity packed into it. We get a view of what deforestation looks like in Madagascar as we drive through a forest recently slashed and burned for farming. I love those serendipitous moments when you get unexpected photographic opportunities. This is amazing. This tamarind tree behind me is literally full of giant fruit bats with wingspans up to three feet. It's very cool. I've never photographed fruit bats like this before. I'm getting a really nice shot right now of a single bat hanging, and the sun is just catching his eyes in a very nice way. And it's beautiful. It looks happy sitting there in the breeze and looking straight at me. Not a bad shot for an upside down bat. The fruit bats are known also as flying foxes because they really do look like foxes with big wings. Right as the sun will set now, they all take to the air. And when they fly overhead, the sun backlights through their wings. Madagascar's diversity of landscapes becomes obvious as we enter the spiny forest. Well, this is kind of a, a pretty tough environment to have a village. Well, this is a village of the, the Antandroid people. These are the people of the spiny desert, and they live in what are probably the harshest conditions of any human group in, uh, in Madagascar. Very little water here, and obviously it's uh, quite, quite difficult to eke a, eke a living out of this, uh, this desert, but they managed to do it. Yeah, so and everybody's hanging out under these trees. Yeah, trying to keep cool in the, in the heat of the day. Do you know how to say hello? And... Salama tumku. Salam tumku. Salama tumku. Salama tumku. Salama <laughs> Salam tumku. Salam. <laughs> is really relegated to, the, what, the south and the west part of Madagascar, right? Yeah, it's basically in the southern part of the country, and this region is really very, very special because of the plant species that are found here, 95% of the species and 45% of the plant genera are endemic, not just to Madagascar, but to this region alone. Walking through the spiny forest is a real treat, simply because virtually every plant and tree is unknown to me. They look like cactus, but they're not. They're very pointed and prickly, and yet there's this sublime beauty to the place. It's like a prehistoric garden. It 
It's quite an experience to be in the spiny forest and suddenly stumble upon two troops of Safaka battling over territory. All right, this is great because you're getting a fight between two groups. You just saw this one animal yeah. scent marking the tree, and now the other ones are scent marking over there. So they're just bouncing towards one. Look, 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 they're right in the border between their territory. And they're, oh, this is excellent. Didn't think we'd see this. <laughs> they move like, so fast. Yeah. This is a great place. I'm right on like the demarcation line between two troops and they use this tree right here to go back and forth. Oh, look, 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 look. Oh, look at the tail. Oh. Look at the way he whips the tail around. Well, let's go and uh, keep following these and see if there's a couple that are sitting in the late afternoon sun. Great, great shot right now, right at the end of the day, the sun has set, it's really in the shadows and these Safakas who are running around all day long, now have just, it's like their toys have just run out of steam. And I suspect this tree is the one that they probably find every evening. They're settling in for the night and they're just all warm and cuddly and it's a great shot. The lemurs in Madagascar are nocturnal, so you gotta go out at night yeah, if you want to find them. Just starting to come out. Well, it's a great time to be looking for the mouse lemurs and the sportive lemurs. They should be out. Uh, it's nice and warm. We're looking for eye shine, right? They're looking for eye shine. Yeah, there's a reflective layer at the back of the eyes of lemurs, and it glows like coals, orange coals. Oh, there is one. I got one. Got one already. This is the mouse lemur. This is the rufous gray mouse lemur. So cute. The eyes are so large for a mammal this size. It's one of the smallest primates on Earth. It looks like a mouse, but when you see its hands, it looks very much like a primate. and trees. These baobabs are up to 1,200 years old. From a distance, they look like cartoon caricatures of trees, but when you get up close to them, they overwhelm you with their sheer size. And they're literally water tanks. They retain water that enable them to survive through the long, dry season. And they're great subjects to photograph. They're almost like upside down trees with the trunks and the roots reaching into the air. People are drawn towards simple forms in nature and they don't get much simpler than the baobab. They almost look like children's drawings. I'm just shooting a great shot that exemplifies the back country of Madagascar. It's a zebu cart with beautiful baobabs right behind it. Right on cue. They tower over the landscape. They dominate the landscape. And I love photographing them at sunset when the low angle of light really reveals the texture of the trunks, but also highlights each and every limb. 
Even a brief visit to this spectacular place reveals its abundance of unique plants, animals, and landscapes. And realizing what we see today is only a fraction of what it once was is a reminder of how precious this island is. Madagascar's plants and animals have taken their own unique twists and turns through time. Today, this strange and wonderful island is one of the most biologically significant and yet threatened places on Earth. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge.